welcome back. Um, this is um, a uh, another session of Controversies in Science. Um, I wanted to begin by thanking uh, this week's speaker for being so flexible as to um, uh, be able to give his talk this week rather than next week, uh, because uh, Norm Lepla, our speaker next week, uh, had kind of a medical issue that needed to be taken care of. So um, he's he'll speak next week. And thank you, Paul. Um, so our speaker today is Paul Gibbs. He's a professor emeritus in the Department of Infectious Disease and Pathology in the College of Veterinary Medicine at UF, of course. He um, graduated as a veterinarian and received his <coughs> PhD from the University of Bristol in Eng England and later became a fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Medicine. He worked for 10 years at the Institute of Animal Health in England uh, on diseases such as foot and mouth um, disease, blood, blue tongue, sheep, fox, and rinderpest. In 1979, he joined the brand new College of Veterinary Medicine here at UF, uh, where he taught courses uh, and did research on emerging diseases. Throughout his uh, career, Dr. Gibbs uh, studied emerging diseases that threaten human health, what we know now as One Health. Uh, he's worked on West Nile virus and canine influenza uh, and other difficult to pronounce diseases like encephalopathy. Um, this uh, research took him to uh, many developing countries. And in fact, he was uh, has done a lot of international research uh, in this One Health arena. He's recipient of a number of prestigious awards, such as the Wooldrich uh, Medal from the British Veterinary, so Veterinary Association and the Distinguished Service Award from the Florida Veterinary Medical Association for his work on emerging diseases. So today, uh, Dr. Gibbs will speak on From Cowsheds to MRNA, Vaccine Successes, Failures, and Controversies. Is that making any? Okay. Whoa. Now it's too loud. All right. Are, are we happy? Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, where was I? Uh, um, right. We're going to be talking about vaccines. And I can guarantee that all of you in this room have some relationship with vaccines both good, bad, and I'm sure you have different opinions. So we're going to actually uh, be talking uh, about vaccine hesitancy. And we'll uh, introduce you to that in a minute or so. OK, I want you, first of all, to go back to December of 2020. Uh, and that was when 
the COVID vaccine arrived here. And this is a vaccine that really is a marvel of molecular technology. Amazing that uh, we could develop such vaccines so quickly. A lot of the science was already there, probably as early as uh, 10, 15 years previously, but it really had never been tested. Uh, and I think this uh, quote here from The Economist of 2020 is rather interesting in that it is really hard not to wonder how something so small, in other words, a vaccine, can essentially address a problem so large. And I think we have to remember that uh, at that point, we were all very scared. And at that point, uh, which was essentially December of 2020, the vaccine came in. And then by February of 2022, we were looking at 80% of the population had in fact been vaccinated here within the United States. But if we look at uh, what the current situation is as of January the 13th, we're now recognizing that in fact far fewer adults are getting vaccinated with the new bivalent vaccine. Uh, and in uh, Alachua County itself specifically, we're seeing that about 17% of the population has actually accepted the new vaccine. But relative to our age group, uh, we're looking at about 50% here in Alachua County. And interestingly, we can uh, reference that a little bit later. But let's not forget, in fact, the impact that we have seen from COVID. And obviously, as someone who's worked on emerging diseases all my professional life, did it really come as a surprise when we got COVID? No, not honestly. The, the good news, and this may sound very paradoxical, we have been very lucky that COVID is not associated with an even higher mortality rate than actually it, it's got. But even having said that, at the moment worldwide, we've seen at least 7 million deaths, many more. And alone here in the US, we've seen up to uh, 1.2 million deaths. So this is the impact that this disease has had. And vaccines, obviously, as I'll tell you later, have been very powerful in terms of reducing this mortality. But uh, just uh, over two weeks ago, here in Alachua County, we had 38 patients in hospital and eight of those patients were in ICU. So this is an ever present uh, threat to our health at the moment. And obviously we would like to see many more people vaccinated. So this talk is going to explore two basic questions. Is because I always like to pose a question and try and answer it. Um, and here we've got two questions. Is vaccine hesitancy attributable to a lack of public trust in science? And if that is the case, uh, why? Uh, and then we have to recognize that in fact politics, as I've already said, strongly come in uh, to the discussion. And let me define what vaccine hesitancy is. This is the World Health Organization definition. Uh, it refers to a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite the availability of vaccination services. So this is roughly the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'll outline to you some of the principles to begin with. Uh, then we'll talk about vaccine success stories because there are some enormously powerful stories to tell here. And many of you will have a personal perspective on some of these diseases. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, really the failures of vaccines because that comes into our understanding of why people may uh, reject the concept of vaccination. And then we'll address vaccine hesitancy itself look at some of the implications of that uh, at all different levels. And then I'll come to a few suggestions of how we may look to the future, some of the ways in which we can perhaps correct vaccine hesitancy. I want to point out to you that uh, there is up here 
usually a number on the slide. If I mention something that you don't understand, uh, we can come back to that slide later. And I've given Jane uh, a PDF that she can distribute, and the PDF will have these hot links so that if you want to follow up on something later on, uh, then you can do so. Okay, Jane has explained to you my background. I, I've been very fortunate to work with diseases all around the world. And uh, several of you probably know my wife, Christine. She's of, often over here at Oak Hammock. And uh, Chris and I have uh, two daughters, one of whom is uh, an infectious disease specialist, qualified in internal medicine, a physician. The other one is the chief vet for the wildlife refuges, works with wildlife influenza and things of that nature. So I have a sort of foot in both the medical camp uh, and also the veterinary camp. And of course, at one point, veterinary medicine and human medicine were virtually one and the same thing. So what are some of the basic principles of using vaccines? Well, essentially what we are looking at is the potential of using vaccines, they're not always available to us, uh, to quickly damp down any potential of an epidemic. And what we always want is to have effective global surveillance. And that surveillance, of course, depends upon countries releasing information. And when it comes to China, there's always been uh, a history of somewhat hiding what's been going on uh, in China. And obviously, many different diseases have emerged from China long before COVID. Uh, we've had SARS that's come out of China, and we've also um, had some veterinary diseases as well. And the ideal situation is that that surveillance will provide us with information so that we can prepare ourselves for the potential uh, introduction of that particular virus or agent into our own country. So early detection then becomes important, and obviously in that context, we need to have good diagnostic technology. In the case of uh, COVID, regrettably, the virus was pretty well established in the United States before we, in fact, recognized it. Uh, and just to add to that, we had a certain degree of arrogance at that point, and instead of using the World Health Organization designated diagnostic test, we went with a CDC test that turned out to have many problems with it. So we were behind the eight ball in many ways when it came to uh, our initial response to COVID. And when we talk about action, we have many different approaches, obviously quarantine, movement control, disinfection, masks, social distancing, and that applies uh, obviously, without, in fact, having vaccination available. In the case of COVID, if we ad address COVID, we didn't at that point have an antiviral that was available to us, nor obviously did we have a vaccine. Within veterinary medicine, we have an additional uh, tool, and that is depopulation. But obviously, uh, depopulation is we find, uh, uh, sorry, constrained to uh, uh, veterinary medicine. I just want to point out to you that the Centers for Disease Control has this quote, that vaccines are one of the greatest success stories of public health. The other great success story is, of course, uh, sanitation. If we look at the early report card for the US on COVID, um, we recognize that we dropped the ball somewhere when it came to surveillance and detection in the United States. The international community very quickly was able to sequence this virus, and that then was the secret to, in fact, initiating the uh, development of vaccines. And we were fairly confident we could develop a vaccine because there are various veterinary vaccines that address coronaviruses, and in addition, a vaccine to SARS, the related virus uh, to COVID, that of SARS, 
a vaccine had been developed, but of course it had never been commercially produced because SARS, in contrast to COVID, uh, died out on us. We don't know at the moment where it uh, comes from. It probably has come from a wildlife species, probably a bat, and the isolation of different viruses that are within this same family would strongly suggest that it has a wildlife host. But we still do not know that. And you obviously know that there is quite a lot of controversy as to whether this virus was an escape from a laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. So the second principle we need to address, and, and you are very familiar with this, is that of herd immunity. So we recognize that to prevent outward transmission of the virus, we ideally need to have uh, most of the population vaccinated. And this uh, is going to differ from one virus to another. But in general, for a highly infectious disease, we are ideally looking at about a 95% vaccination rate uh, for a population before onward transmission uh, can be stopped. And measles is the, the obvious example of that. Now, the politics within the United Kingdom, uh, and also to a certain extent here in the United States, was that, well, why don't we just let this virus rip? It's not really that important. Uh, and perhaps we ought to just address the protection of those populations that, or those demographics that are particularly susceptible. And, and in the case of COVID, it was pretty quickly recognized that it was our age group as opposed to children. And there is a great discussion still going on as to what is the correct approach. And if you are interested, this great Barrington Declaration is interesting to read. And the argument there was, and this wasn't from a national inquirer, this is from scientists and sociologists and the like, that in fact, we didn't need to clamp down on a, a movement to the extent that we did. And that, for example, we shouldn't necessarily have been vaccinating children because ethically, should we be doing that? Have a look at that if you're interested. Um, it is uh, a very interesting read. There are about a million people have now, scientists and the like, have now signed that particular declaration. Okay, so that gives us some of the parameters within which we are using vaccines. And now let's talk about some success stories. This is the pinnacle, really, of vaccine success. Smallpox. It was a horrible disease. And it really was the scourge of Europe. It came across to North America, uh, spread within North America widely. And this is a uh, description from the 1840s, uh, which describes uh, smallpox. This is a child, I think, from Afghanistan, probably in the 1960s. And uh, Smallpox, thankfully, was eradicated globally uh, in 1980. It was declared to be eradicated in, in 1980. It has not returned. There's always the fear that it could return in the form of biological uh, warfare, but that's a lecture for another time. Then the other disease that has been globally eradicated is rinderpest. Rinderpest kills somewhere in the region of about 90% of cattle, and therefore it destroys uh, food sources. Uh, was present in Europe for centuries, and then uh, got into Africa. And it was in Africa that uh, we were finally able to use effective vaccines. And as a result of using those vaccines, we were able to declare in 2011 that the disease was eradicated. This is a photograph from Iran um, in the, the 1970s. And the quote here that so many dead cattle and so close together that the vultures had forgotten how to fly. And because of the Maasai's great dependence, that's my daughter, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so 
uh, yes, the Maasai being so dependent upon the cattle culture, there was starvation within the Maasai uh, when the disease entered into Africa. So this is the individual who probably has been my mentor for most of my life, Edward Jenner. Obviously, uh, not in person, but in terms of his character and his interest in wildlife, his interest, obviously, in cow sheds, and then, uh, obviously, the development of vaccination. This gives you an idea that uh, this disease was killing annually in Europe, somewhere in the region of about 400,000 people a year. Uh, and this was clearly the situation when Jenna decided that based on really folklore, that you could protect people against smallpox using a virus that was detected in cattle. This is the facsimile of the inquiry. And uh, this particular lithograph up here is rather famous. And this shows the lesions of cowpox on the hand of Sarah Nelms. And Jenna used the material from Sarah Nelms' hand to vaccinate uh, James Phipps. And of course, now we would not be permitted to do this. I don't think the NIH or would uh, countenance this. But in fact, and this is the scientific principle here, that Jenna challenged James Phipps uh, with smallpox. And you know the story. He was uh, immune to the challenge. And from that point on, the whole concept of using cowpox to protect against smallpox uh, became well established. Literally within the inquiry was 1798. Within a matter of two or three years, the, the vaccine was being used uh, here within the United States as well. When I started my career uh, in Bristol as a veterinarian, I was working on viruses of cattle, and by great uh, coincidence, I stumbled across an outbreak of cowpox in cattle, which actually is very rare. And just to confuse the picture, cowpox virus actually comes from rodents. That's another lecture yet again, okay? Uh, and it spills into cattle, and it spills from cattle then into people. But of course, we don't hand milk any longer, so we don't see cowpox in the people who milk cattle. But we do see cowpox as a zoonotic disease occasionally in people who've been handling rodents in Europe. Anyway, I discovered this outbreak of cowpox. And in some ways, the rest is history. I then began to learn a lot about Jenna. And the incident in Somerset is it was about 30 miles away from Jenna or where Jenna practiced. This is a chantry in uh, uh, Berkeley. And if you go to the UK um, and if you go to the Bristol area, it's a great day out. Uh, there's a castle near Jenna's home as well. Um, and there's a great tea shop there and everything else. And I make it almost, you know, a pilgrimage whenever I go back to the UK to go to uh, Jenna's home. And I always like to ask you a question. Do you know the name of the cow that provided the virus for uh, Jenna indirectly through Sarah Nelms? And we'll come back to that later. And those of you who know your cattle breeds will instantly recognize this as a Gloucester cow because she has the white stripe down her back. Right, that's my veterinary involvement. Okay, all of you here, I would assume, can I have been vaccinated against smallpox? Most of you got the mark on your left arm. And if you were conscious of your bikini, et cetera, you had it down here. Um, yes. Right, and you know that it was quite a nasty lesion in many cases before it really healed up. Well, that was the virus that was used then worldwide with a slight modification. It became known as vaccinia virus. And the last outbreak in the United States was along the Rio Grande. Uh, that was in 1949. But the World Health Organization in 1966 took this momentous decision 
to undertake a global program of smallpox eradication. And at that point, about 2 million deaths were occurring annually across the world. And for reference, COVID deaths in one year in 2020 was 3 million. But smallpox was inflicting 2 million per year uh, across the world. And the technology for smallpox vaccination is there using the bifurcated needle. The last case was in Somalia in 1977, and uh, fairly shortly after, 1980, they declared, the World Health Organization declared that the disease had been globally eradicated. And uh, it took another 30 years before they put up this uh, commemorative statue in uh, Geneva, which I found surprising. Okay. Let's now go, go back to the 19th century. Robert Koch was very famous. At the end of the century, he and Pasteur, they were looking at the concept of microbes causing disease. Robert Koch became very famous because he recognized that tuberculosis was caused by a mycobacterium. And for that, uh, he essentially got the Nobel Prize. Such was his fame when rinderpest ravaged Africa, it got into Africa uh, when the Italians invaded what was then Abyssinia, and then it spread rapidly, affected the wildlife, um, and decimated the cattle populations. Cut long story short, he came up with what was essentially an inactivated vaccine. And if you were to go to the veterinary laboratories in Andersport, uh, outside Johannesburg, there uh, within their little museum is in fact an original sample of that particular vaccine. And, and uh, when I did that and went there, I mean, that was to me a very powerful event. Anyway, cut long story short, vaccines were subsequently improved. Uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations then working with many different countries working with many different funding agencies, began to uh, take on the, the challenge of eradicating this disease. And by 2011, we were in a position to announce that the disease had been globally eradicated. These gentlemen were the architects, essentially, of the smallpox eradication. Uh, DA from here in the US and Frank Fenner uh, from Australia. This is the publication that celebrated it. And a number of us then, me coughing here, a number of us uh, have been working, and it was just published in 2020, the equivalent of rinderpest and its eradication. The publication, the book on rinderpest, uh, is a uh, PDF. If you have any trouble sleeping at night time, there are about 850 pages of it, about 200 different authors, um, and you can download that PDF completely free of charge. All right? Okay. So now let's jump, and I would love to talk to you about rabies and pasture, yellow fever, and, and Tyler's development of that, but let's now talk about these two diseases, polio and measles. And I'm sure that all of you, or many of you here, will have some perspective on poliomyelitis. Uh, because this was the disease that certainly stopped me from swimming in the rivers in mid Wales. And likewise, here every summer, there was always the fear in the 50s that polio could be uh, affecting individuals who were likewise trying to enjoy summer. There were two individuals uh, associated with the development of vaccines, uh, Jonas Salk and, and Sabin. I had the good fortune to meet uh, Dr. Salk, and uh, I missed Albert Sabin because he actually came to the institute I work in, in Purbright in, in the UK. Uh, because foot and mouth disease, which is a disease I have worked on for many of my years, 
uh, is very closely related to polio. And uh, he came over for discussions at the Purbright Institute. So the situation was that in 1988, WHO decided in conjunction with many other organizations to in fact look at the eradication of polio by the year 2000. And the good news is that polio has been eradicated from the Americas and polio is currently eradicated from Europe. The target of eradication by the year 2000 obviously has not been met and I'll come back to that a little later. Well, there was some controversy at the time relative to the, who should have taken a lot of credit for the development of polio vaccines. Let's not address that issue because it's a long and complicated one, but let's simply say from out of that then came the successful development of a measles vaccine and measles vaccines were then introduced uh, in the 1960s as well. Most of you, I would think here, probably have had measles. Uh, there's a young lady here saying, no, she hasn't, which is good. Um, you got the vaccination, you must be. Okay, right. Um, and measles is still a killer around the world, and we seem to forget that. And interestingly, measles is very closely related to rinderpest. Okay, they're both mobility viruses, and the other virus that's in the story here is canine distemper. This is the sort of family. Um, and the situation is that as of 2016, September of 2016, the World Health Organization declared that the Americas were free, uh, in fact, of measles. And once again, the target uh, for the eradication of measles was set at 2020. Unfortunately, we've not been able to meet that, although obviously you can see here that there has been significant uh, achievement during the period running up to 2020. Which then brings us to the global impact of COVID-19 vaccination. And arguably, this is the largest public health campaign in history, that within uh, the first eight months, some two billion people had become fully vaccinated. Uh, but we really don't know the full impact of the vaccination. Very difficult in many ways to, uh, to assess all of this. And clearly, at the moment, a lot of institutions and scientists around the world, social scientists, are trying to establish, in fact, the, the true impact. But the National Bureau of Economic Research here in the US, as of October of 2023, estimated that the vaccination campaign across 141 countries that it looked at averted 2.4 million excess deaths. Um, and then they put a, an economic value on that as well. And I think this particular photograph uh, to the left here is particularly poignant in that the individuals who are attending the patient here have got a photograph of themselves actually on their PPE. And from that we, um, or from the whole concept of the vaccine development, there are three different uh, uh, companies producing vaccines. The two top ones are based on messenger RNA and the other one is based on a vector expression of the spike protein. Right, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, vaccine technology. And I'm not gonna give you a lecture on this, but what we have to always address when we develop a vaccine is the balance between safety and efficacy. And obviously, the closer that you are in many ways to the infectious agent itself, then the, there's a greater uh, expectation that you are going to produce a wider immune response and therefore you're going to get better protection. And what we have looked at over the course of time is that the early vaccines, sorry, I've got wrong button here. Let's go back again. 
um, with the greatest efficacy are the vaccines against smallpox, uh, rinderpest, and measles. They are live attenuated. So in other words, attenuation means weakness. And usually the early vaccines were developed empirically. So you uh, simply passage the virus through cell cultures, which came in in the 1950s, and that was the great breakthrough. Uh, but this was really a very, um, well, the word is empirical. In other words, you passage it for two, three hundred times. This was definitely the case with Rinderpest. And at regular intervals, you then tested it, and you found that it had, in fact, attenuated, become attenuated. And that simply meant that the genome had, by passage in cell culture, had changed. So now it lost its ability uh, to cause disease. But ultimately, we, particularly when we uh, started having the ability to look at viruses at the molecular level, we were then able to synthesize vaccines. And ultimately, and this is the difference between when we come to the messenger RNA vaccines, all we're doing there is sending, in fact, a code so that that protein in this, in the case of COVID, uh, the spike protein can be uh, produced by the cells present within the body. So we have believed that as we've worked progressively towards the nucleic acid vaccines, that we are moving towards yet safer vaccines. But these messenger RNA vaccines now are actually in themselves raising a few questions. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is based on an adenovirus vector, uh, and that means that we have molecularly changed the genome of the adenovirus so that, in fact, there's an inserted gene there that is then coding for that particular protein. So we have moved from the cow shed to the messenger RNA vaccines, and, and that uh, is a very interesting history with many different vaccines featuring uh, along that uh, continuum of, of time. When we come to vaccines failures, we have to recognize that there are many reasons for failures. Um, I'm not obviously going to go through this as a list. And we have to recognize that vaccines should always be used within the context of the interaction between the host, the agent, uh, and the environment. And we should look at vaccination also within the context of other ways in which we can prevent viruses from spreading. This is what's called the Swiss, Swiss cheese model. Um, and I think most of this you clearly can see is applicable to the ways in which we have tried to control uh, COVID. So now let's talk about a few of the failures and let's talk about polio. And the early uh, vaccines produced by the United States using Salk's approach, which is inactivation, in some cases, particularly a vaccine that was produced by Qatar, uh, the inactivation process was at fault, and live virus was in effect then vaccinated or was used as the vaccine uh, for children. And you can see then that uh, 40,000 children developed polio, 200 were paralyzed, and 10 of those died. But despite that, because of public pressure, the fear of polio, uh, the other vaccine companies that were producing vaccines correctly without this uh, problem with failure to inactivate the virus, they continued to, in fact, use those vaccines. And you know that uh, the end result of all of that is that, of course, we eradicated polio here in the United States. But when it came to using the uh, Sabin vaccine, which is a live virus vaccine, unfortunately, uh, some of those early vaccines contained a contaminant virus, simian vacuolating virus, because of the cell substrate in which the virus, the vaccine was produced. And that's uh, a virus that is associated with um, cancer potential. 
Uh, and there's always been this fear, but studies over the course of time have indicated that in fact, uh, no uh, human tumors have been actually associated with the, the vaccination. So that was one that was creating a major scare at the time, which now takes us to the present situation. So the, the vaccines that have been in use uh, until very recently have been vaccines that have been attenuated using this empirical process. And the vaccines have the ability to revert to virulence. And that is what has happened. So now we have a situation where in terms of wildlife, sorry, wild virus as it's called, uh, polio, we've been seeing these uh, occasional cases between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And there was one recently here in, in Mozambique. But then the orange dots and the green dots represent polio that was caused by reversion to virulence. And that is because these viruses, uh, the oral viruses, um, can actually then spread from person to person. And that is how, in fact, this reversion has occurred. We have now got improved vaccines. Uh, so the prospect of eradication of polio uh, is very real. When it comes to COVID-19, the World Health Organization recognizes that COVID-19 vaccines, as indeed other vaccines, can actually cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and there are other concerns. As you know, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been associated in a very small number of people with blood clots. We're getting some evidence that there are probably neurological symptoms associated with uh, vaccination as well. And it may contribute, the vaccine itself may contribute to some cases of long COVID. That said, I want to emphasize that we are talking about very, very small numbers of cases. Uh, and if you look at it on a cost benefit analysis, and obviously the, the cost here is a complication from vaccination to the benefit, there's no question that vaccination for the individual is something, unless that individual is, is significantly immunocompromised, then you go ahead with vaccination. We don't understand at the moment the true pathogenesis of these uh, complications. There are some who have even used the term spike spikeopathy almost to indicate that the, the spike protein in one way or another is associated with some form of pathogenicity. But at the moment, we don't know. And pathogenesis. Uh, is, is essentially the progression of disease or the way in which disease is produced. So vaccination failures um, significantly provide, I would say, justification for vaccine hesitancy uh, and can be used as a justification by some individuals if they don't have a good comprehension of the, the benefit-cost analysis. So now let's uh, move to vaccine hesitancy. I've already defined to you what it is. And this uh, statement here, it's complex, context-specific, variant cost time, place, and vaccines. Different vaccines have different associations with vaccine hesitancy. Um, but it comes down to complacency, convenience, and confidence. And the confidence is where we have to address the lack of faith or lack of trust in government institutions, et cetera. And obviously vac vaccines in a way are a victim of their own success. And I want to point out to you here that we're all remarkably poor at assessing risk, but that we want vaccines to be 100% safe. We get on the roads and we drive and we acknowledge that there is a risk there, but somehow when it comes to vaccines, we are not prepared to uh, accept that risk. And that may be because we don't really understand it. Vaccine hesitancy is, has actually been mapped within the United States. Um, and this was from uh, 2021. 
interestingly. And you can see that around us here in uh, north central Florida, we have a greater acceptance of vaccination than we do in some of the surrounding counties. And it uh, comes down to about 20% of most populations. If you look at right across the United States, look across, let's say, the uh, Western world, we're looking at about 20% hesitancy when it comes to vaccination. Hesitancy in this context saying that you refuse it, but obviously there's a spectrum there as well. The cost in 2019 is that measles reappeared in the United States. You may remember it was eradicated in uh, 2016 from the Americas. And uh, we had cases within uh, several different states. Currently, as I speak, there is a resurgence of measles in Europe. Uh, we recognize that we need, because measles is so infectious, about 95% vaccination rate. And you can see here that the data are indicating that about 25% of children entering school within the United Kingdom are not vaccinated. And measles does kill. On a veterinary side, and, and a very different twist to vaccination, you may have remember that at one point there was a major, major epidemic of foot and mouth disease, and uh, about 10 million animals, 10 million animals were slaughtered. That's what depopulation means to halt the spread of the virus. And yet we knew there was a vaccine available, but there was reluctance to use it. Um, and that was partly because the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, wanted to get reelected. He postponed the national election, et cetera, et cetera. So the general public lost faith in the veterinary profession and why, if you've got a vaccine, do you not use it? This is a lecture, obviously, in its own right. Fred, Gregory, talk to you about these different uh, explanations of why people have a mistrust in science. We have to recognize that vaccine hesitancy is not new. Uh, shortly after the vaccine was introduced, Jenner's vaccine was introduced, we're talking about four years later when this cartoon was produced, essentially that uh, people, if vaccinated, would come up with all these horrible, disfiguring cows that were emerging from their skin, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Interestingly, uh, objections to smallpox vaccination, uh, control of uh, the freedom of individuals, came up to the Supreme Court here at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. The Supreme Court ruled that the state may be justified in restricting individual liberty under the pressure of great dangers to ensure public safety. So obviously we revisited that somewhat uh, with COVID. The major uh, <coughs> concern when it comes to vaccination of children relates then to an individual who was in fact subsequently forced to withdraw a scientific paper a physician who maintained that measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, MMR, was related to autism. He was essentially barred from medical practice in the United Kingdom, so he went into Texas. And as you can see then, a whole history from that, and he was at an inaugural ball for Trump, calling for the CDC uh, to be shaken up. And uh, Jenny McCarthy, the face of obviously the anti-vax movement when it comes to uh, MMR vaccination because she had a child or has a child with autism. And you can follow these links if you so wish to get more information. This is a case study here in Florida. Um, it's based on the New York Times from July of 2023. Quite complicated obviously, but it shows early on that Florida was in fact ahead of the nation in terms of vaccination. Um, and uh, this is looking at the 65 and older population. So all of us here need to be proud of that. But then by mid Florida, 
um, this advantage had been lost, and this is obviously in uh, terms of July of 2021. And in terms of the nation, sorry, in terms of the under 65, we were lagging, in fact, the, the national average. And there were, in fact, uh, implications for this. Pretty complicated data here, so I'll just highlight what's in red here. So because of that, when the Delta variant hit, we then found that, in fact, uh, Floridians were dying at a higher rate adjusted for age than almost any other state. And that was according to the Times analysis. Then there was a paper produced by the School of Public Health at Yale, and that concluded, in fact, that had Florida reached a vaccination rate of 74%, was in fact 60% in adults, and 74% was the average for the New England states, and this is the the most important line here, it could have prevented more than 16,000 deaths and more than 61,000 hospitalizations that summer. Those are the stark statistics um, uh, relative to the vaccine hesitancy in Florida. So you can take Fred's uh, analysis of the different areas where we can detect that people might be uh, hesitant to use vaccines because of these various uh, parameters that Fred defines. And it is interesting then to look at what the uh, purpose of Florida Health is, and it says that it works to protect, promote, and improve the health of all people in Florida through integrated state, county, and community efforts. So, now we can start putting together all the different factors, arguably, that contribute to vaccine hesitancy. And you can see here that we have obviously a number of factors that are all related in some way or another to each other. Um, and it's in some cases, the right of the individual to obviously refrain from vaccination. But then if the individual does that and doesn't accept any societal responsibility, then we don't get herd immunity and therefore we get progression of disease. Um, so the rights of the individual versus the rights of society come in. And obviously that's where sociologists need to uh, guide us. And we can recognize that celebrity culture comes into this, whether it's Jenny McCarthy or whether it is other characters well known to us. And of course, the very fact that vaccines normally take a lot longer to produce than the messenger RNA vaccines took, and, and even the, the terminology of warp speed has brought into question whether in fact, you know, this really is a con job because what does warp mean? Well, I think that comes from Star Wars, and it was it really appropriate to use that terminology. So these are some of the things that we can debate at length. This is a book that came out uh, just recently by a very prolific author who is the dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. Um, I can leave this with Jane if anyone's really interested in it. And he has said that there is a public health crisis. So arguably, there is a crisis for many different reasons within public health. Uh, lack of funding would be, be one, but also because perhaps those working in public health have often prioritized the cultivation of influence over the pursuit of truth. So that brings us to uh, the two questions. We're coming up at 2.25. I posed two questions to you at the beginning, or to myself. To what extent is vaccine hesitancy attributable to the lack of public trust in science, and if so, why? And because of all those different factors that I've outlined to you, can I come up with a simple way forward? No. Can I explain a lot of the different ways in which 
the public trust has been eroded in terms of science? Can I explain the attitudes of individuals, whether they're politicians or individuals? Not easily. And I wondered how I was going to really sort of wrap this up. And I thought of the, the concept of the wicked problem. And I think a lot of you know what a wicked problem is. It's a terminology that essentially says that a, that when you look at an issue, it's complex, there are innumerable causes, it's difficult to describe, and you don't have the right answer. And I thought, well, you know, this is quite interesting that I've come up with this idea. And then I thought, and of course, this is where you suddenly realize that a lot of other people thinking about this. So I went and searched on wicked problems vaccine. And lo and behold, here is someone who had been writing about this using even 1796. In other words, that's when Jenner did his experimentation. Uh, he published in 1798, but 1796 was when he was doing the work. And this individual has published on finding a way to address a wicked problem, vaccines, vaccination, and a shared understanding of how we should, in fact, progress with uh, persuading people they should get vaccinated. So in some ways, vaccine hesitancy is this Gordian knot. How do you really solve this problem? And I hope that that will then provide for us uh, at least an opportunity to discuss it. I'd be very interested to know your perspective on all of this. So how do we go forward? Well, these are just a few observations and a few ideas and, and a summary of what I've told you. Um, vaccines are definitely a very important weapon that we have against infectious disease. The history of vaccination, the global eradication of at least two diseases, the prospect that we're going to eradicate further diseases, polio and possibly measles. Um, but on the other hand, it's being constrained at the moment by vaccine hesitancy. It's coming across into veterinary medicine as well. Uh, it's not unique just to human medicine. We're seeing that, as I said, some diseases like measles potentially could be eradicated. Remember, it's closely related to rinderpest. So the prospect would be that we should be able to do this. The public's lack of trust in science, I would argue, is a significant driver. And we're battling against this celebrity culture. I mean, a former president was a celebrity in terms of The Apprentice. And that culture seems to be powerful within our society. Um, and then we have to recognize that there are politicians and even some physicians who can or who are uh, subverting vaccination. And we get into this whole arena then of what is the Hippocratic Oath and, and things of that nature. So very powerful, disturbing conversations, to be quite honest. How do we offset vaccine hesitancy? Public health authorities need to improve their messaging. Um, we need to recognize that there are individuals who need to be educated. There's this area in here of vaccine hesitancy. It's not a a blanket, I refuse it or I accept it. There are, it's a continuum. Um, we need better vaccines and I can talk to you at length about that. There is a phobia by some, understandably, mothers who don't want to have their children vaccinated because vaccines, there are some 14 different vaccines, many of which have got to be injected using a needle. Um, and people don't want to see children vaccinated using needles. But I think what we have to recognize is that we need many different people to come together. I don't think uh, that scientists in general, and arguably even public health people, have recognized the importance of the social sciences. Uh, and I think we need to address that issue as well. Okay, so what is the cow's name? Daisy? Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, it's Blossom. All right. Okay. So, Blossom's Hyde is actually in St. George's Hospital in London. 
Uh, it was given by Jenna's son to the hospital because Jenna had trained at St. George's. It's there if you want to go and see it. Um, and most importantly, we have to recognize that the very word vaccine comes from Latin. I'm sure you all know this. The Latin word for cow, hence vaccination. All right? So if you take nothing away from this lecture, <laughs> if you can remember that vaccination comes from uh, Latin. And what about quarantine? Where does quarantine come from? Quarantine comes from the Italian, and I, for 40, which is, I think, quaranta, which was the period uh, for which boats could, uh, would have to stand off from the port of Genoa if they had infectious disease on board before they could come into port. Okay. Um, thank you for your attention. I've gone through that at some speed. As I said, Jane has got a PDF which she can distribute to you, and then you can follow up on, on some of those links as appropriate. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? That was outstanding, and thank you so I much. I apologize for, that I've gone late. Oh, that was outstanding. Thank you so much for sharing the slides. Um, yeah, sure. I have I have an interest in two that you obviously understandably didn't mention: tuberculosis and malaria, are yes. still huge killers. Yes. And when I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa, I was supposed to. Um, do a vaccination campaign to the villages for BCG, which is a yep. which is a vaccine they use. I've been vaccinated. Have BCG. you? Okay. Yep. We've never used it here in the Bacillus States. Bacillus of Camel, Camille and Guerin. Yeah, and I yep. wonder where that stands. And the n there's apparently a new vaccine for malaria. What do you think the likelihood is that those vaccinations will help eradicate two still horrible killers? Yeah, um, the first thing is that I would have to say that I'm a virologist. I'm a veterinarian and I'm a virologist. I don't follow the malaria story in great detail, nor do I follow in great detail the TB story. I mean, TB is still a major problem even in the veterinary field with spillover to people. In large part, uh, tuberculosis spilling over from animals into humans has been solved by uh, pastulosis, all right? So now it's it's not a public health problem in terms of zoonotic disease. Uh, the From what I understand, obviously, as you say, vax, uh, malaria is a major, major problem. Um, and of course, the other way is which in which we're addressing that is to potentially protect mosquitoes from transmitting it as well, which is the mechanical side of it with the bed nets and everything else. Um, there are also drugs that are coming through. But in truth, I cannot answer your question in any great way. You could probably tell us. What do you think? You have the microphone. Because of what you've talked about, acceptance of vaccination and yep. delivery methods, which was an issue for me, um, I don't have a lot of confidence. You know, a new vaccine has been developed against malaria, but being able to deliver that to the populations who need it will be extraordinarily difficult. And I just thought you might know where the the TB vaccine stands. You've had it yourself, and why we haven't had it in this state. Well, yeah, the, the BCG vaccine, all right, the problem with that in terms of detecting people is that it leaves you obviously with an immune response that you cannot differentiate from a natural infection. And that's why the US has not gone ahead with that process. And it was discontinued also uh, within the UK. I mean, I was vaccinated as a kid against TB. Um, what I can say in terms of using, using vaccines in 
developing countries and um, was the history of Rinderpest. Now, Rinderpest got to a certain level and then there were these low level little outbreaks occurring in different parts of Africa and we couldn't really finally eradicate it on the continent. And then we began to realize that we really needed to be talking to the elders, the wise people in the villages, all right? So instead of blanket vaccination, it then became very targeted. And I whipped through that slide, but there's a word there called participatory epidemiology, which means that you bring people in, you discuss with them, how are we gonna do this? In addition, when it came to eradicating the disease in Sudan, southern Sudan, uh, the, the civil war was going on, one of the previous civil wars. And what happened there was that human vaccination was going along with uh, veterinary vaccination. The aid agencies were able to operate because people recognized how important it was to control Rinderpest. And then they said, well, look, if we can get people into these areas for rinderpest control, why don't we also then combine it with human vaccination against other diseases? And in fact, that was the vehicle that was used. So I think that's where I draw my perspective on the social science. So you can use vaccines that are not perfect and you can eradicate disease. But what you need to have is the buy-in from that community. And I think that's where somehow we are failing to um, get the balance within the developing world. And this is, of course, introduces us now into this whole arena of social media and the issues of Jenny McCarthy and the like. And it's very, very difficult to really stop that. Hi, Paul, that was fantastic lecture, wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to just mention that about malaria, I had seen a show on PBS a couple of months ago that they have successfully developed a vaccine against malaria, which has been approved by FDA and WHO and is in production for supply first to Africa, where malaria is most prevalent and leading to sickle cell disease. But anyway, my question to you, Paul, was um, in one of your slides you had that when people are not, when the vaccination rate is not high enough and the virus is still present, that's when it mutates and you get the new variants. Is that what happened with COVID, that we keep getting new variants of COVID because of the fact that vaccination is not at that level? Well, when it comes to RNA viruses, and I'm, I'm not a molecular scientist, all right? So I've got to qualify my answer in this respect. You get uh, mutants being formed constantly, and, it, and arguably with RNA viruses, because you don't have self-correction of the replication process, you have all these variants. And theoretically, therefore, one of those variants will be an immune evasive variant, and that's the one that then gets passed on. Um, and obviously, if you have got uh, immunocompromised individuals, then they are not counteracting in the individual itself. This is the argument why Omicron developed, for example that uh, an immunocompromised person may in fact be more likely to produce a variant. I'm sorry? Well, th then that variant gets transmitted from person to person, right? And, and obviously when you, in Darwinian theory, if you are using a vaccine, you are putting evolutionary pressure on that virus to mutate in the first place because you're suppressing all the viruses that are actually susceptible, yeah, to that particular antibody. Let's okay. go over to Zoom. Pat Harden, if you'd like to unmute. Yes, 
uh, my question was, you had mentioned some problems with the, the Moderna, the mRNA. I think you just answered the question, but now you've raised a question in my mind, since most of us in Oak Hammock got the Moderna, are we walking around being carriers of COVID? <laughs> no, no. Um... <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that. And, and I was trying to stress all the way along this cost-benefit analysis. What I'm trying to say is that we, we, and I'll use the word scientists, we as scientists have to be honest and say that there is a risk associated with vaccination. And, and there are many reasons why we have to recognize that risk. But if we look at it in terms of the individual, the risk of, of going down with the disease and the implications of that are far in excess of the risk of developing some complication from being vaccinated. That said, if you are an individual who is deemed to be profoundly immunocompromised, then obviously you need to have that discussion with a physician. I am not a physician. I'm a veterinarian, all right? I'm not presuming in any way at all. Um, but it, and this is an oft-used expression. I try to avoid using it. But at the end of the day, which is what we all use these days, let's recognize the value of vaccination. But let's also recognize the social responsibility that we should all carry to, in fact, seriously look at whether we should get vaccinated so that we develop herd immunity. So these are the balances that we have to address. Okay, and Rick Gold, if Thank you want to. Uh, thanks so much. I uh, wanted to go further into your comment about problems in South Sudan. It seems to me that one of the major issues in, pre in preventing vaccination programs from being effective is civil war and the fact that uh, people in certain area of the country don't recognize the authority of the central government and therefore they don't recognize the authority of the health authorities. Um, so that's one comment. And then also- uh, in, Can I stop in 19... you there for a moment, Rick? Go ahead. I'd simply say that this is where the elders, at least if we're talking about Sudan itself, this is where the elders come in who can recognize at the village level the importance, in fact, of vaccination to their cattle. And, and remember that cattle are so important to many societies in Africa. Um, and with that, then, is there is this vehicle for human vaccination as well. Very good. Uh, and so the, the related comment is that uh, uh, in the 1980s, I, I attended a training on uh, responding to refugees uh, coming into a country. And one of the first points was that, that it, as soon as there are large refugee inflows, uh, the first thing that you have to do is to vaccinate for measles. Uh, could you explain that? Well, the... I think the, the recent data that are coming out of uh, Europe at the moment would indicate that uh, vaccination of individuals against measles is important because measles is, is arguably one of the most infectious diseases of people. Um, and you've got to, th th there have been various societies, uh, various studies an individual called Black at one point, way back in the 50s and 60s, looked at what the critical population was for the transmission of measles. And uh, measles in a, a, a susceptible population spreads very rapidly indeed. And therefore, you've got to get people vaccinated. Because it, it's, and you need, and you can talk about uh, the different mathematical constructs here, but you need about 95% of the human population vaccinated to prevent the onward transmission of measles. Okay, oh, 
Thank, thank you very much. Um, I've, uh, a couple of things. One of them was that uh, BCG is used here uh, for installation uh, into the bladder for bladder cancer, I guess because of its immune stimulant ability. Exactly, yeah, but yes. It, but it is used sometimes. Um, it's also used as, as the protein is used in, in conjunction yeah. as an adjuvant to vaccines as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then um, also I think a lot of it with vaccine hesitancy as far as measles and that in children is that so many are given all at once. And I yep. had a, a two-day um, vaccine course with the CDC several years ago. And I think one of the things that they did say is that a child's immune system isn't fully developed until they're a little later. And they start when they're tiny. Yes. Uh, I, and uh, myself, and I know a lot of my friends, we, we waited, spaced them out, and then finally got the last uh, bits when they had to go to school. But, uh, and there was a very a highly respected pediatrician in town who was doing that uh, to uh, just to spread them out. Um, another thing is... Um, Can I, I stop you there for a moment? Yeah, the ontogeny of the immune response in the, the young animal uh, is very interesting. And then, of course, you have maternal antibody as well that confuses the issue because maternal antibody can block vaccination as well. But to your point, I think there are 14 different vaccines that children are exposed to or have to be vaccinated against. And it's not just one jab, it's in some cases two jabs, all right? And I use the word maternal phobia, that, that mothers understandably don't want to see their kids being poked and they, they get distressed by the fact that the child is crying. Mm -hmm. And if there's any doubt in their mind because of Jenny McCarthy and the like, then it, it's further amplified by that. Uh, another, well, just the thing on uh, that's up there now about big pharma, there's such a revolving door. And I remember a few years ago, it was somebody who had, was involved with developing rotavirus, and they were trying to get that approved as another vac vaccination for, for children to be in the list of required vaccinations, because they went from big pharma in, into the CDC. But I get um, uh, like notices from the health department because I'm still licensed. And Ladopo's latest is advising not vaccinating for COVID unless you're 65 or over and or else immunocompromised, which what kind of effect do you think that has on providers? Because many of them are working, getting government money, you know, and working for uh, state institutions. And I saw that our, um, the director of our health department was asked about this, and he refused to kind of comment on it, which I thought was, what a shame. Yeah, um, I can comment sort of somewhat indirectly on, on that. Uh, I was talking to Katie, that's my daughter who works at the moment. Um, she worked for the public health folks in Florida initially. Um, and then the politics of Rick Scott got in the way in closing down her HIV clinics, um, which is another story. But the reason I say that is that Florida's got a history, unfortunately, of not necessarily addressing the issues as they should do. But she said, uh, Dad, you can, I mentioned I was going to be giving this talk. I was just talking to her last night. And she said, well, Dad, let me give you an example about vaccine hesitancy. She said, I've always, because of my training and everything else, I keep on pumping people. You know, you've got to get vaccinated. And she said, I'm giving up on it because I'm getting so much resistance to it. And she said, yesterday, I had a person who um, needs to be vaccinated against uh, hepatitis and the like. And uh, he refused. So she said, but you're taking antivirals. So, you know, you, you're prepared to take antivirals. Well, why won't you take the vaccine? I just don't want to take vaccines. And she said, at that point, she recognizes now that she gets cut off all the time. Don't want to do it. And there's no real logical reason that's given. And I think that's where we're failing to educate. Um, Well, wait, wait, Miss Ruth, one moment. Um, 
Jane or Lynn, do you want to read this chat that's been here since the beginning? I can't speak to vaccination hesitancy in other countries, but in the US, I believe capitalist consumerism is greatly at fault. It's easy to distrust a huge heartless corporation, especially when there are already examples such as the opiate epidemic where capital gains have been prioritized over human health and no one is punished for that. Is vaccination hesitancy as big an issue in countries where there's universal health care? That's the question. Uh, there is, in fact, on one of the slides. Um, can you go back? Yeah. Um, let me think. Go back to, if you can go back to vaccine hesitancy. There, there was a survey, um, which is, and published in Nature, by the way, and, and a lot of this information that I present to you is referenced as opposed to using the National Enquirer. Um, let me see if I can just let me see if I can find it quickly, okay. which will specifically address that issue. Uh, I, I lost the cursor. There we go. Right. Can you bring that one up? Okay, so I, I sort of glossed over this, obviously, because there's so much in this lecture. I mean, I really enjoyed doing this lecture, uh, but I'll be honest with you, it, it, I found it very difficult to come to any great conclusions at the end as to how we can effectively address it. Let me just point out to you China. China has got a 97% acceptance rate for vaccination. Um, okay. The global average of hesitancy okay. is estimated by this paper. And as I said, these are all hot links. So if, if Jane circulates the PDF, you, you can follow the actual paper itself and analyze it um, at your heart's content. But you can see that there are different uh, levels of hesitancy around the world, no doubt for different reasons. So then the question, I suppose, is if you take the United Kingdom, which definitely has a national health service here, and the United States, you will notice that they are very similar. All right. Um, if you Canada. take Canada, um, which yeah, obviously better. has got a a national health service as well, or at least an organized, I'm not, not exactly sure how it works in Canada. Um, but uh, you can see there that vaccine hesitancy is, is less. Um, what can you draw from that? That um, in large part, there is inherently a mistrust that is running probably globally around about 20%. Anyone want to comment further about? <laughs> well, um, I'm afraid, interesting as this is, we do need to um, end out. here. And if you have other questions, please um, just come forward and talk to Paul. <laughs> okay. Uh, and thank you. For every, and thank you so much, Paul. Very interesting. I'm sorry? Um, uh -huh.